Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, as Lynn said, I'm a mom of three, grandmother to uh, three, a pastor's wife and an, an admin assistant at a school. I, uh, I would describe myself as someone who's an introvert. I like people, but I love being on my own. And I'll talk more about that in the session. I, uh, uh, I've been told I'm kind, compassionate, I'm more serious and funny. I'm outgoing when I have to be, but uh, I do prefer being a homebody and, and time to myself. I have become passionate about mental health through my own journey. Just over 20 years ago, I was a busy mom, preschool teacher, and a pastor's wife with no thought at all to my mental or emotional health. I love my church, my job, my family, but I didn't have joy. I was pushing myself through my days and all the while feeling that I was falling into a pit or a wall that I couldn't go through, couldn't go around, or couldn't go over. My circumstances were fine. There was nothing traumatic happening. There was some stress in ministry. I just didn't understand what was happening to me. I was motivated. I was unhappy. I was having some stomach and bowel pain. I had lost my appetite. I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't want to do anything. Plus, I was having a lot of trouble sleeping, as well as what I found out later were panic attacks that I would just have out of the blue where my heart would just pound out of my chest. And I didn't know whether I should go to the ER or, or what I should do and what was causing this. I don't know where you are today or where you're in your life right now, how you're feeling or even not feeling. I plan to share what I've learned on my journey hoping this time together will give you permission to take a look at your mental health or those close to you in a vulnerable way. I will also share a bit of a skeletal outline of steps that we can take and that I've taken to improve my mental health. If you're in a bad place this morning, um, I apologize. I'm going to give a lot of information. It might be overwhelming. So I would just encourage you just to take your time um, listen if you can, listen if you don't, um, feel like you can, but just, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. So you can always listen to this later at some point or, or, um, explore some other avenues, but yeah, I am going to be throwing a lot of information at you this morning, just a, a note about that. So on the first PowerPoint, um, slide, I'm, I've just got the steps that I'm going to be going through today. Just get that up there so I can see it. The first one is acceptance. You know, there's so many symptoms of mental health. There's fear, there's worry, there's panic attacks, there's anxiety, there's thoughts of suicide, there's physical symptoms that you get, there's depression, there's feeling alone, and the list can go on and on. You know, we're meant to feel emotions. They are not sin. If you read through the Gospels and look at Jesus' life, you will see that he was not afraid to express his emotions. That term, oh, you're just being emotional, I just cringe when I hear that. We're meant to be emotional, but that term often gets used in a derogatory sense. God created us with emotions, and he means for us to be emotional. I also find that it's time to be vulnerable with our mental and emotional health. There's been a notion forever, it seems, that Christians should not struggle in that way. They shouldn't get depressed. This is false. We are human, and depression and mental health issues are not sinful, nor are they necessarily caused by sin. And taking the step to say, oh, man, something's not right in my life, and to accept that notion. If we stay in denial, everything is going to stay the same. Accepting that something wrong is going on can be very difficult. It can be daunting and it can be scary, but it's crucial. Part of accepting what we are going through is waiting. This is a time during this time when you're kind of at the beginning and accepting is to wait on God. At this point in my life, I didn't know which way to turn. I asked God to do whatever he needed to do to draw me closer to him 
And I totally abandoned any plans that I had for my life at that time, besides still being a wife and a mother. I had to accept the pitch. I had to recognize it and I had to call it what it was. Waiting also involves trusting, giving up control. We often think that we have to fix the issues on our own. Trusting that God will do his best for us and often trusting others with their help is very important. Waiting is also resting. This is a whole new topic that I feel in our culture that we don't tend to adhere to. We want to burn out for God. I don't know if that's as popular as it used to be, but back in the, when I was a teenager, that was a popular slogan. When missionaries come home, we make them travel around um, looking for more support and sharing their stories. When a lot of times in reality, they need to be resting and they need to be recharging so that they can go back to the mission field intact and not depleted. We often don't give our pastors or our ministry leaders sabbaticals. We often don't even take our own holiday uh, holidays that our bosses pay us to do. I recently read a book by Kelly Beleri, and it's called Rest Now. She talked about how rest includes drawing away or drawing apart. It means saying no. It means setting boundaries. It means being still in our work and also in our minds. The definition of rest is to cease work or movement, to refresh oneself, to recover strength. And this should also be our goals when we're resting. Mark 6 verse 31 says, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Jesus was also an example of this. I'm not totally sure how much time he had to rest because he only had the three years of, of really intense ministry. But he didn't take rest or solitude lightly. There were many times in the gospel that he shows us the examples of rest and stillness. We need to rest our minds, our bodies, and our agendas. Rest will mean different things for different people. You need to do what's best for you, not what others think that you should do. I would have loved to have checked myself into a facility at that time. Um, it was about like 23 years ago that I was going through this and just to get some help and find out what was going on. But I had a busy husband. I had young children. Um, we didn't have any family around us at all during that time. So it just kind of seemed like that was not a choice that I could make. I was also concerned about my children during this time. They, I don't, of course, why is mom laying on the couch for days at time, barely even able to smile or even function? I didn't want to go away and make it more traumatic for them. So I was trying to think of myself and, and as a mom as well. I was also a pastor's wife who was depressed. And that didn't fit in with some of our church people's beliefs. I was even one told one time just to get over it. So I did what I could to take care of myself in the circumstances that I was in. During my time of rest, I quit my job. I quit the church. I removed myself from people and I focused on my own health. I recently listened to a podcast um, about with Rick and Kay Warren. Now, their son had struggled with mental health all of his life, and when he was 27 years old in 2013, he committed suicide. In their grief and shock, and for the good of themselves, they totally quit everything for one whole year, just like that. And they, um, they said they, they weren't angry at God, they, um, there was nothing like that but they just needed time. So if a mega church pastor like Rick Warren, who has churches all over the world and has his finger in so many things, can, take, can do that and rest, we can too. Waiting might mean practicing transparency by telling others what, about your struggles and having them pray for you. Waiting can mean accepting our own weaknesses. Waiting also means admitting that there's a problem. Waiting can also mean a blow to our pride. It can mean getting labeled or being stigmatized. And it can mean people looking at you differently, tiptoeing around you, treating you like a weakling or someone that they don't know how to talk to. 
but it is necessary to deal with any kind of denial and accept what is happening. Once we do that, we can move on to the next step, that of discovering. Discover. It's time to try to find out what's going on in our minds and body. This is where we often need the help of professionals. When I found that I needed to see a counselor, I could not fathom that I would ever need to go to one. I didn't want to deal with the stigma of having to see a therapist. I was the one who counseled others and helped them, not the other way around. I could not physically even pick up the phone to make the phone call. So my husband had to do that for me. And I'm so glad to this day that I made that step. I was listening to a documentary about Fred Rogers the other day um, and, uh, you know, um, from the neighborhood. And he said something that really struck me. One of his quotes was, you cannot grow until you are truly yourself. So it's time to do some digging. During the time with, with my counselor, I discovered that I was very focused on doing and working for God rather than just being. I had very high expectations of myself and what I thought people expected of me as a pastor's wife and also as a person. I considered myself to be a strong person and that I could just handle anything that was thrown at me. I even realized that I was living with the belief that God only loved me for what I did for him. That was a huge defining moment for me, and I realized was one of the sources of my burnout. I had lived all of my life as a Christian since I was a little girl with the belief that I was loved by God um, for what I did and not who I was, and that um, that was just huge for me. And by this time, too, I was also emotionally bankrupt. I didn't feel happy. I didn't feel sad. I absolutely just felt nothing. That's hard to, hard to explain and describe, but that's, that's the only way I can say it is that I was bankrupt, that I couldn't conjure up any kind of, of emotion. I was taking care of everyone else, feeling I had to meet every need, and feeling guilty when I didn't meet the needs that I saw in our church or family or around me. I had nothing left to give to anyone. It's important to identify our emotions, embrace them, and listen to them. We don't have an unlimited supply of emotional resource. Great care must be taken how we use them, and great thought must go into building up those resources as well. This time of discovery for me is still ongoing, but at that time it was more intense, and I would say it lasted about um, two to three years. Don't let that scare you. Once you've accepted that you are experiencing some mental health issues, it's vital to discover the source of what you are feeling and why, and then the why. What is causing your brokenness, your fear, your anxiety, your depression? There usually is a source. Discovering that source is crucial. It could be a false belief, a distorted perception, a traumatic event. It could be the loss of a loved one. And there are many, many others. In order to be able to move forward, we have to know what we are, where we are coming from and what we are moving on from. You know, God loves broken people and he loves to restore. The brokenness in our lives gives him a chance to get in amongst those pieces and do his work without us kind of getting in the way. I felt so incredibly weak in myself during this time. And that was actually a really good place to be because it forced me to draw on God's power and on his strength and on his healing. Here are some practical ideas I have for you on discovering the source of our mental health. And this is just kind of the tip of, our, of the iceberg. Get a complete physical, a medical physical. There's chemicals in our brain that can be lacking, that can be helped. See a therapist, a pastor, a counselor, someone who can dig into what you are experiencing and point you in the direction that you need to go with advice and strategies. Something else that, uh, this isn't for everybody, but during this time I also journaled um, and I wrote down what I was feeling. It's amazing how real that makes things look and it, and it helps us learn things about ourselves. I don't ever read that journal anymore because it's pretty disheartening to read, but at the time I needed it so that I could see what was happening in my life. 
and I just don't know that person anymore. When I when I read that journal, sometimes when I'm preparing for something, I'm like, was that really me? Did I really write those words? So it's it, it's it's very um, um, cathartic for those of you who who would like to journal. As I mentioned before, be still. Go away somewhere where no one is needing you or asking anything of you, where you don't have to make any decisions, where you can truly focus on yourself without interruption, where you can hear God speaking to you. You can read some books if that's something that you like to do. Listen to podcasts, exercise, take care of your body as well as your mental health. Do things that you find enjoyment in, um, nature, um, just sitting on your deck in the sunshine, um, a walk, playing a sport, um, sewing, gardening, crafting, whatever it is that gives you enjoyment. Eat well. Sleep. I still struggle with this, and I take a non-addictive sleep aid as well, uh, and I'm still on a low dose of antidepressants as well because my brain is low on serotonin. But sleep is, is so important to how we function. Go back to your roots. Who are you really when your job, your ministry, and your family is all wiped out of the picture? It might be helpful to talk to family and friends and get their perspective on how they see that you're living your life and some of the decisions that you're making. I believe that if we don't know and accept who we really are, it's very hard to be who God means us to be. I spoke at a ladies' retreat um, a year ago, and um, I shared this passage with the ladies. We were talking about our identity in Christ, and it comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. And if you want to get a boost and know what your identity in Christ is and how he feels about you, read that passage and write down some of the some of the things that you see there and then this is what uh, this is just a short tidbit of what you see in there this is how god looks at us we're accepted we're adopted we're redeemed we're holy and blameless we are forgiven we have an inheritance and we are lavished with grace like aren't those great um things to think about how god looks at us and how we need to look at ourselves I also learned through this time that I was giving others the powers to define who I was. I learned that my focus was on doing rather than being, and now I strive for a balance of both. My next point is confronting the past or the next step. This might not pertain to everyone's situation that's listening today, but I wanted to just touch on it. Our past is unchangeable. And we cannot change it, but we can change our response to it. One of my pet peeves is when people claim, well, that's just who I am, or I've always done it that way, or um, nothing's, um, there's nothing I can do about it. To me, that's a declaration that, that that person is not willing to have God change them, teach them, and grow. It's not necessarily, I can't change but, but possibly, and I won't change. I was definitely in a rut. And despite being miserable, it was scary to think about making some life-changing decisions. I had a family to care for. I was in a church. I had a job. My decisions wouldn't just affect me. They would affect those around me. I can't begin to tell you the freedom that I experienced when I left the past behind me and moved on. I know some people that choose to continue to be a victim of their past. I have a, a person that I, I work with, a Christian lady, one of the teachers at our school. And a lot of times when she had had a traumatic experience as a teenager, and she continually brings that up and, and continually chooses to be a victim of that circumstance instead of moving on from it, yes, learning from it, but not choosing to let it define her anymore. There's a really good quote from Mel Robbins. It's coming up on your screen right now. When you carry bricks from your past, you keep building the same house. This was also, a, I thought, very profound. When you carry bricks from your past, you keep building the same house. In other words, if we keep letting the past dictate our lives, we're gonna keep dealing with the same issues. 
You know, God invites change. Change is a form of growth. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us to grow. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, 21 says, in whom the whole building being lifted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Not has already grown, but is growing. That means that we are moving and changing, not staying in one place. Yep, the past has defined many of our thoughts, our perceptions, and decisions that we make. But today can also be the start for you. As Dr. Phil has often said, this can be a defining moment. It's up to me, it's up to you to make the choice. The choice doesn't belong to anyone else. Have you ever said or thought, oh, I won't ever get over that? No, you may not. And it may be something you might deal with forever, but you can get through it. We can learn some very valuable lessons from the mistakes and choices of our past. We must go back and destroy those paths. Some of those paths may be behavior patterns, certain friendships, or destructive habits could be negative thoughts. We don't want to go down that road again. Time to take a different path. Our next step is learning the lessons, and this is the bulk of my, of my talk today. I was about six to nine months in after I was diagnosed with depression that I was finally um, ready to start learning. After I had taken care of myself, um, my health was improving, the antidepressants were starting to work. I was starting to feel a little bit better. And at that time I thought, okay, I don't want this to happen again. It's time for me to do some studying and make some changes in my life. You see, it wasn't anyone else's fault. It wasn't anyone else's responsibility for I went through. I was not living my life in a way that was mentally healthy. At that point when that happened, I hadn't even ever given thought to my emotional and mental health. And that could be partly because of the era. It was something that was a little bit of taboo to talk to. Now it's out there um, everywhere, not just in the Christian circles, but in, in other circles as well. Um, so that kind of been part of it, but this just kind of was like a blow, um, on the head to me, like, look, you got to see what's happening with you. My counselor revealed a few things to me that were very helpful and that I hadn't realized. She said that I was too compassionate. I didn't know there was such a thing and I needed a better strategy when I made decisions. I would make a decision and then I would mull over it for weeks. Did I do the right thing? Should I have done? Shouldn't I have said yes to that or that kind of thing? So she gave me strategies to help me with that. My medical doctor at this time continued to monitor me and the meds that I was on. I also began looking for books that would help me. I'm a reader, so um, I looked for books. And not a lot was available 22, 23 years ago. I don't even think there was such a thing as Google to look on. We didn't have very much money, so I couldn't really afford to go buy a book. But I did it anyways because I knew something had to change. Um, so I did find a couple of books at that time that were helpful. And in the years ongoing, I have found more that I've been reading, and I'm going to share those with you at the end of this session. I And as I read, I read slowly. Um, it can be overwhelming um, when you're, and as I read things, and as I saw things, oh, that applies to me, I would highlight it in the book, and I would write it down so that I wouldn't forget. And then I would I often just maybe read a chapter, and then, a, on, and then kind of mull on and try to figure out how I was going to I um, put that into my life for a couple of weeks and then I would move on. I would, I wouldn't overwhelm myself. And I just slowly digested um, truths that were pertinent to my experience. I also continued to pray and ask God to open my eyes, to give me a willing mind, a willing heart, and to enlighten me and show me what I needed to know. One important truth that I learned is not to expect others to understand what I was going through. No one else besides God can know exactly what you are experiencing. We have this saying in the educational world for those that are on the Asperger's or autism spectrum. Once you have met a child with autism, you have only met one child with autism. I believe the same truth holds for mental health as well. You, we, I might be able to relate to some of you today, um, with what I'm saying, but chances are 
I mean, I'm not going to be able to relate to a lot of you. And I might be able to relate to certain areas in your life, but not to others. But I can't claim that I can totally understand exactly what you're going through. So if you're if that's a point where you're at, I would encourage you to drop that because and, and to not waste your emotional time and energy because that's just something that um, is just going to be a drain for you. I know quite a few people that struggle with fear and anxiety. I believe that Satan is using this as a tool to cripple Christians. The phrase fear not in the Bible is used at least 80 times. It's not a suggestion necessarily either. So, there are places where it sounds to me like it's actually a command. God knows that the enemy uses fear to decrease our hope, to limit our victories, and to keep us captive. We were not saved and redeemed only to limp along in the Christian life. We don't want to be riddled with fear and anxiety. Fear can also mean a lack of power, a lack of faith. 2 Timothy 1, 6, 7, which I know a lot of us have heard through our lives, says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. God can give us the power to confront and defeat our fears. We all get scared of things, but I believe that this verse is talking about the fear that can rule our lives and cripple us. I understand from this verse that fear needs to re be replaced with God's power and our self-control. It's funny, when I was studying for this, that was the first time that that really hit me. It says God gave us a, did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power. I also believe that a lot of our issues arise from our thinking and our perceptions that we have developed either through our past, our childhood, or our insecurities. Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, I like the way it says it in the messenger. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted in your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Other versions of the Bible say the renewing and transforming of your mind. This verse to me is a real gold nugget. It's also the cog in the wheel of our mental and emotional health. It makes sense, doesn't it, that how we think defines our mental health. For me, I expected a lot of myself, and I would berate myself and make myself feel guilty for the mistakes I made, for the stupid things I said, for if I didn't say the right thing at the right time, or when I should have done something and I didn't. I grew up with a beautiful, almost perfect sister, so I thought, who I knew was the favorite, and everyone seemed to like her better than they did me, and I constantly compared myself to her and came up short, and I let that thinking dominate a lot of my thoughts and perceptions and my life, and she's a wonderful person. It's nothing that she did. It was all coming from my perceptions. Our mind is the catalyst to everything in our life. Buddha even said, the mind is everything, but you think you become. I believe the Bible also speaks to this when Jesus mentions that as we think about things, that is who we are. If we think negative thoughts that terrible things are going to happen, we are robbing ourselves of joy and, and robbing ourselves of enjoying the here and now. If we are critical, the words we speak and the way we live will be a consequence of that. We need to learn to focus on our thought patterns and insecure and negative thoughts and turn those thoughts into something positive and energizing. Lisa Turker says, the experiences that I have affect the perceptions I form. The perceptions I form eventually become the beliefs I carry. The beliefs I carry determine what I see. I found this very profound. If you can, take some time to think on this truth and unpack it in your life. Take some time to write down some of your experiences 
then your perceptions from those experiences, then your beliefs from those experiences. Changing the way we think changes our perspective. We cannot change what we have experienced, but we can choose how the experiences change us. Second Corinthians 10 verse five tells us to take every thought captive, every thought, not just some. This requires a focus and a stillness, and it involves finding strategies that work for us. This will be different for everyone. For me, when I find myself seeing someone and I immediately want to judge or criticize, I think of a compliment that I could give them or something that I really appreciate about them. I say a quick prayer for them. Um, a couple of years ago, as I was uh, driving to work uh, um, in the mornings, this was in the winter, I, I kept seeing this lady and I think she was probably in about her early 20s or maybe she was even late teen. She was very overweight and she just had this look of intense sadness on her face. Um, maybe not even being sad, but just, I just got the sense that maybe her life wasn't very joyful. And I prayed for her when I, she, cause she would often walk across as I was waiting at the light. And when I saw her, I would just pray and ask God to bring someone into her life that day to give her some tidbit of joy, to have some Christian pass her way. And uh, that kept me from thinking, oh, well, we sometimes think, oh, you know, she doesn't look very happy. Like what's wrong with her? You know, what I have learned in my life is that everyone has a story and we have no idea what that story is. So we need to treat them with respect and kindness because we have no idea where they're coming from. If Satan's trying to get me to feel bad about myself, I send him away. And I think of a scripture or a positive characteristic about myself or something that I have done or a compliment that somebody's given me or something that I'm proud on. I kind of pat myself on the back in my mind, but not enough that I get um, puffed up with pride. I ask God to, to keep me humble. Try um, some anchor thoughts. Instead of, I will fail, how about I will try? Or instead of, I'm not good enough, how about but I'm getting better every day. Think, think of some anchor thoughts that you can be using in your head when those thoughts pop up into your head. Turn the negative into a positive and practice it. And it is going to take practice. Turn your nerves of fear and anxiety into excitement. Example, I've heard people say, oh, my children are flying over the ocean or they're driving a long distance. I'm so scared they're going to have an accident or something's going to happen. Well, that's not good for us. Instead, how about turning those thoughts into, I'm so excited to see them. I'm going to cook their favorite meal. I'm going to meet them at the airport. I'm going to get the house ready for them. Turn those um, thoughts of fear into, I'm so excited to see them. Leave them in God's hands. If I start feeling overwhelmed and start thinking about all of the stuff that I have going on and need to do, I stop and force myself just to think about today. And again, all of these things that I'm talking about are intentional. And eventually, I believe that as we practice them, the more it's going to become more of a habit. Um, one of the very first books I read that had come out like 25 years ago was Traveling Light by Max Licato. And if you're looking for a book, and you could probably find it somewhere on Amazon or whatever to start out with, that's not very heavy. It, he talks about burdens that we carry that we're never meant to carry. I would recommend um, this book. He unpacks Matthew 6, verse 34. This is another golden truth in scripture that I have chosen to live by and practice in my life. And again, I like what he, how he says it in the messenger. It, it says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Be present. This takes practice. As you are listening today, check yourself. Am I present right now? Am I, am I listening to this talk? Or in my mind, I'm already thinking, oh boy, after this, I'm going to go for dinner. I'm what I'm going to do this afternoon. What's happening next week? That's not being present. Um, maybe some people are thinking, I don't know what I will do if I get COVID. You will when the time comes. I don't know what I will do when my kids leave home and I have an empty nest. You will when the time comes. I could never do this, or I could never do that, or I could never do what God's asking me to do. You will be able to do that when the time comes. He goes on to say, the key is this. This is what Max Lucado says. Meet today's problems with today's strength. 
Don't start tackling tomorrow's problems until tomorrow. You may not have tomorrow's strength yet. You simply have enough for today. This doesn't mean that we don't plan. It doesn't mean that we don't have common sense because we, we still need to do that, of course. What I did is I actually threw out my day planner uh, when, as I learned to apply this truth to my life because I was making list upon list about what needed to be done today, next week, next month. And then when I checked that off my list, oh, that felt so good. But it wasn't healthy for me because I was not focusing on today or I wasn't enjoying what God was showing me today. I wasn't enjoying my children doing something today. I wasn't enjoying being present and taking the day as it came. Sometimes my husband will ask me like on Monday what I have planned for the weekend. And if I'm at a place where I'm deleted, I honestly don't even think about that. I haven't even thought that far ahead because I don't know where my energy levels will be at that point. Unless it's something like this, for instance, that I had been planning on. I'll decide to do that on the day when I get there. It provides me with freedom and balance and helps me to be present. And I mean, my husband has been great. He's been so supportive. He knows that, let's say there's something going on that he sometimes doesn't know to, that I'm going to something till I jump into the car with him because I am waiting to see if this is something that I, that I can handle. And he's, he's really good about that. So um, making those decisions, living in the present also provides me with balance. And speaking of balance, that's something else that I would like to touch on. For me, balance is huge. And this is the word on my letter board that you're seeing right now that I have in my kitchen as a reminder. A component of balance that has become one of the found, or sorry, the component of balance has become one of the foundations of my mental health. And boundaries are also a component of my mental health. Boundaries are borders. They help us to see the valuable and to ditch the peripheral. They keep in what matters and what doesn't. They preserve simplicity and prevent complexity from taking advantage of us. And um, this book, Rest Now, that I mentioned before, if you're looking for a book about um, boundaries, this is a very easy read. It's not overwhelming. And she um, has some very good chapters on how to incorporate those into your life. I think that we've made the Christian life too complex. We need to go against our cultural strains and simplify and get back to the basics. I have learned to say no. I have also learned that I don't have to give an excuse when I say no. We often think that people take advantage of us, but in reality, we're letting people take advantage of us. We give them the power of how we serve and what we do in our lives. To have boundaries is to preserve space and time for what God really has for us. And I want you to hear this for those of you that are burnt out, worn out. Boundaries are not selfish. They're not shirking our responsibilities. They're not an escape. They're not us trying to get away from our responsibilities. And they are definitely not a punishment to others. You know, Jesus, as I mentioned before, only had three years to fulfill that intense ministry time on earth. We're not shown in the Bible what happened during that time all of it, but we did do see in the Gospels that he did take time for himself. He spent time just hanging out with the disciples. He went to celebrations like weddings. Um, he went to his friend's place for meals. We also see that the disciples often pushed him, infringing on his alone time and questioning him when he made certain decisions. Yet he stuck to his boundaries, even though there were an, an infinite amount of needs all around him. And, and it kind of blows my mind that probably with a breath or a snap of his fingers, he could have healed everybody. He could have taken away anything that anybody was dealing with, but he chose not to do that. And he is an example for us in that as well. So ask yourself today, what is the source of why I do what I do? Is it fear of what others will think of me? Chances are, and someone told me this one time, they're probably not thinking about you nearly as much as, as you think they are. They've probably already moved on from your no or no thank you. Is the source faith or obligation? Are you doing it because you have prayed about it and have asked God if it's something that he wants you to do? Or is it 
well, no one else is saying yes, or I'm the only one who can do a good job of it, or is it a need for control where no one else can do it the way exactly that I want to see it done? Is it hope or the hopeless sense that you have to rescue others or come to their aid? I struggled with this as a pastor's wife. I still do. Comparing myself when I saw what other pastor's wives were doing and, oh, why wasn't I like them? Or thinking that I was responsible for the needs of our church family and for their growth. Once we recognize the source of saying yes instead of no, no or thanks, I can't do it at this time we can then learn to set boundaries for ourselves. Once we recognize, or sorry, I just said that. I have also found that we do need to be flexible. Boundaries are not set in stone and they have to be flexible. And to be honest with you, today I am coming to you very worn out and very at the end of my resources. Our kids and our new grandbaby were just here for about a week. And then our other daughter came after that. I've been preparing for this workshop. Our school office, I work in a school with uh, 500 people, is incredibly busy this time of year. June is just like mind blowing. And, uh, and I'm running all day long. Um, yesterday, my dad was supposed to have surgery here in Saskatoon and the surgery got canceled because they found a mass. So now he's in the hospital and my mom is staying with us and we're trying to support her. So, um, None of these items are really traumatic right now um, and terrible, but for me, myself, they are so draining. And, uh, but all of these things are not also non-negotiable for me at this time. So as we're going through this time, I'm trying to get my rest. I'm trying to keep up exercising. I'm trying to spend some time by myself so I can recharge. But I know at some point, that um, I know my body and I know myself by now, I am going to crash and I'm going to crash hard. I'm going to have headaches. I'm, my face is going to feel so tight, like I have a vice wrapped around it. I am going to have to be taking pain medication. And um, I've already been having trouble sleeping this week. So it's already starting to be affect me. And everything from cleaning the house to if anybody asks me anything is going to be a hard no right now. Last week, I also had a text from a former church member who has gone through a, a lot of tough struggles in her life, asking if I could call her sometime. And I have a real desire to listen to her and to help her, but I just can't deal with that right now. Um, so that was me setting my boundaries. Do I deal with guilt? Oh, yes. Do I sometimes feel selfish when I have to spend time on myself and I choose that over other people? I choose that coming to church, I even choose that over my family, I definitely feel with deal with guilt. And I have to, to live with that and to learn to not berate myself for that. I have a job that is very demanding. I wear a mask eight hours a day. I don't get a break. I sometimes have to gulp down my lunch in between, oh, bandaging skinned knees to dealing with the police coming for something or other, answering the phone, and now this year the doorbell, and dealing with a myriad of other requests, helping 50 other staff in whatever they need. But I absolutely love my job. I'm good at what I do. It fulfills me. I use it as a ministry. I love my coworkers and the students, but it also drains me. It stresses me, and I come home with it some days. That is where balance comes in. If I've had a crazy week at work, I don't plan any evening events for myself. I don't answer the phone. Other weeks, I have the energy for it. I don't make decisions of what my week or my month will look like instead of pushing myself to a place where I'm barely functioning. I take it as it comes. Events can go without me. I don't have to be at everything. Life, other people's lives can go on without me. Others can fill in places that are vacant. And if that need stays vacant, well, that's not my responsibility. There's a lot of great resources on how to set boundaries. And as I said, the book Rest Now is a really great one if you're interested in that one. Another lesson that I believe we need to practice in our daily lives is forgiveness. This is also not suggested in scripture, but commanded. And we see many examples in the Bible of forgiveness. I could probably do a whole session on forgiveness, but I just want to share a few nuggets and let you delve into the subject yourselves, if this is something that pertains to you. Every book that I have read on mental health has had a chapter on forgiveness. 
Unforgiveness can be a crucial roadblock to having a healthy mental attitude. Forgiveness does not mean that we believe what happened is okay. Forgiveness does not mean that we necessarily forget the offense. Jesus, God, they're the only ones that can forget offenses. Forgiveness does not also excuse someone's behavior. Researchers have found that forgiveness dramatically improves our lives physically and mentally and emotionally. Unforgiveness allows us to hang on to any anger, resentment, or bitterness that we may have, and that anger in turn will affect us in adverse ways. I have seen people that walk around with anger in their lives, as I'm sure you have as well. They are not doing themselves or those around them any good at all. Uh, some of you who aren't from Saskatchewan may have ho- heard of our huge Humboldt tragedy that we had when the, um, the Broncos, when many of them were killed and injured. And as the trial was going on a year or more later, um, I listened to some of the parents' testimonies on radio. And um, some of them said, yep, yeah, I am going to forgive um, the driver. And I, in my head, I'm going, good for you. You're going to be able to move on and you're going to be able to be healthy. Other people, I heard such bitterness in some of these parents' voices. I am never going to forgive that guy. And I'm like, that doesn't, it it doesn't do anything for the truck driver, you're forgiving for yourself. And I feel bad for those people, what kind of life are they going to live with that kind of bitterness in their hearts? It's a choice, forgiveness is a choice that we have to make and it's but it's also a process. And lots of times we you might have to forgive that, um, whatever it is against that person over and over again until you die. That is why Jesus said in Matthew that we need to forgive 70 times seven. Whenever we feel that resentment overtaking us, that anger, that bitterness, it's time for God to help us. It's time to go to him and ask him for forgiveness again and give that anger, that bitterness, that resentment to him. He wants to take that for us. I find that the hardest person to forgive is ourselves. Disappointment in ourselves and self-condemnation is very hard to get over with and deal with because we kind of can't get away from, from me. These are thoughts and feelings that we need to continually give to God and let him provide the healing. Again, this is something that we choose to do. It was a few years after my depression that I went through ascension with my with a mentor, Anita, actually, who's sitting here today. I don't know if you remember that, Anita, and she, they were out in Saskatoon, and she brought up forgiveness to me. And she led me through some steps of forgiveness. And you know, I didn't even realize that there were people that I needed to forgive. And these people that I needed to forgive, it was years ago already, I didn't even see them anymore. But at, but through that session, I saw my anger and my need to do some forgiving. And again, that brought so much freedom in my life. We don't always look at ourselves honestly and realistic. So if we have the opportunity to have a mature Christian that we trust speak into our lives, take advantage of it. Almost to the end here. I'm now living a new normal. The first slide showed the title of this workshop. I was given this title and no offense to the people in the conference, but I'm not really a fan. First of all, when I heard the term dealing with it, I have a problem with that phrase because that is what a lot of people with mental struggles hear. Why don't you just deal with it? And so it it tends to bring up negative connotations for me. So I apologize to the conference people. And people will say, what's wrong with you? You just need to deal with it. I don't think that message was intended, but because I hear that a lot, I kind of cringe. I believe that they meant that we need to deal with our mental health. And they're definitely right about that. Rising to his call, we definitely need to do that. The focus on our lives should be living the way that Jesus lived and wants us to live. But before and as we are doing, we need to know who we are. We need to know the source of our struggles. We need to see ourselves as God sees us, not the way we want others to see us. We need to know what has formed our beliefs and perceptions, and we need to gain confidence in all of those areas. It sounds like a lot of work, and like I said at the beginning, it can be overwhelming, so please just ignore the parts that are overwhelming you right now and and work on what you need in your life. It's time to get back to the basics and shut out all the exterior stuff that's floating around in our heads. 
and in our lives. And that's very hard to do in our culture nowadays. One of the hardest things that I've had to deal with is knowing that I will never be the person that I was 25 years ago. Even though I desire to do all kinds of things, that desire hasn't been lost. I, I would love to be involved. I would love to meet needs when I see them. I have to accept the fact that I'm now living a different life. I wish I didn't have to continually weigh what I'm doing and thinking so that I don't come to a place of depression again or, or, and possibly have to spend days in bed or by myself just to recharge. I wish people didn't avoid me or not know how to talk to me or look at me differently, but I can't dictate or live by others and their opinions. However, that is now my life. And despite all of this, I have a deep abiding joy that comes with the knowledge that God has brought me through a very difficult journey and continues to sustain me and love me for exactly who I am. I have also learned that a place of weakness is a most rewarding experience because that is when I give up my control and power and let God work. God's not pushy. He continually invites us to come to him to claim what he is offering us. I often wonder how much we must be missing and how absolutely incredible our lives would be if we took all that he wants to give us. I don't have to concern myself with what other people think of me. And although that is often in the back of my mind, I don't let it take precedence. I still have a low dose of antidepressant every day that I mentioned, as well as a sleep aid. I don't want to be on those things. I'd prefer not to be. But my life is much better because of this medication. I can play with my grandchildren. I can do things with my husband. I can have a job that I love and hopefully, you know, be a witness to others. And those meds help me with that. So how are you doing today? Are you at a point where you feel that something needs to happen, that something needs to change in your life? Are you having a hard time just even functioning in daily life, getting up? out of bed in the morning or doing menial things like showering or eating or making a meal or cleaning your house or taking care of your kids? Or are you to the point where you're tired of living? Is your mental health controlling you or are you taking action to control it? Are you at a point where you do not know where to turn or go for help? I would strongly encourage you to accept what is happening, move on from there in whatever path God directs you to. Asking others to pray for you is huge. You don't, when I was going through this, I didn't even know what to tell people to pray for me. They didn't know what to pray for me, but they kept praying. And I know that if I would not have had that prayer support, I don't know where I would be today. And uh, so getting people to pray for you, and that's all you have to say. Can you just pray for me every day that God will be in my life and that he will teach me and give me the strength that I need. I also wanted to um, mention something to those who might be listening, who maybe know someone who's dealing with some mental health struggles. I just want to encourage you to be there for them. Don't try to fix them. Don't condemn. Don't judge them. Going through mental health struggles is incredibly lonely and, uh, because as I've said, a lot of the choices you make are just you making those choices, not others. And that can be very lonely. People don't, like I said before, they can't understand you. They don't know what to do with you sometimes. So give them some respect, people that are struggling, cheer them on. Um, I would even suggest that you do some practical things for them. If it's a young mom that you know of, take her kids for the day or for a sleepover just to give her a day to herself. Make some meals for somebody. Um, if, if you have the means and they're struggling, they had to quit their job, provide some financial means. Um, there's just a myriad of practical things. Send them, send the husband and wife to a hotel one day and clean their house for them or, or send someone to clean their house for them. Um, help them do those menial tasks that's very difficult for them to function and you can just really bless them that way. But don't be pushy. Like when you bring a meal over, drop it at their doorstop and then leave. 
don't stay and visit with them because chances are they maybe don't have the energy for that. Maybe you're struggling with mental health and being around people does help you. Well, that's great. Well, then let people see. I was exactly the opposite, but it could be different for you. Your energy might come from being around people. So then get together with your friends or do whatever you need if that, if that builds you up. If you're already in the process somewhere of these steps that I've talked about today, you go, you keep moving forward, but do it at your own pace, whether it's baby steps or giant steps, just keep on moving and uh, you're going to have discouraging times, but keep on going. God's going to help you. Our past is behind us. It's time to focus on the now. It's time to focus on you. Now, I don't know where we're at for time. Okay. I've got a list of, of resources here that, um, of books that I've read. I just also want to mention that a lot of these books have interactive questions and thoughts after each chapter so that can help you. Um, and also I wanted to mention Mel Robbins at the bottom there. She's not a Christian, but I have listened to her TV shows and podcasts and she's incredibly grounded and, um, very um, down to earth. So she's somebody I would encourage you to listen for if you don't like reading. And the book by Daniel Amen, I haven't read that one. That's on my list to read this summer. He's also not a Christian, but it looks like he's got some really great ways to learn how to train your brain. So now I'm wondering if there's any questions or comments that anyone has for me. Carol, right now we have one comment that has come in on the uh on the public chat and it's from Murray and Carol Hansberger from uh, Wycliffe and they are missionaries in Papua New Guinea. And one of the things that they say is self care is not selfish. The motto of the Kareth Pine or Kareth Creek in Calgary retreat where the Altona EMMC sent us several years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if you wanna to comment to that. Also, if Cheryl, if you're comfortable with it, we can have people unmute their mics and maybe uh, share a comment or maybe a question that way as well if they don't want to just type it in is that okay with you yeah that's definitely okay and i yeah exactly self-care is not being selfish i grew up in a church where i always saw the acronym joy jesus others and you and how you were always supposed to push yourself to the bottom um yeah i don't believe that's the way jesus wants us to live great thanks cheryl um, yep, there is a few more minutes left. Uh, if any of you have any comments for Cheryl, or maybe have some uh, thoughts or some insights that you want to share from your own personal experiences, um, unmute your mic and share it. You can. We'll give a we'll give a couple of minutes. I also wanted to mention too um, that if you're wanting a list of these resources, I'm going to send them to the EMMC office. And so if you're wanting um, the list, you can just contact them by email and they'll be able to send those to you. Yeah, the email address for that would be info at emmc.ca. I appreciate you listening to me as well today. And I've been praying for those who have been listening that uh, God would be working in your lives. And I just want to encourage you to, to, um, to work on your, on your mental health. And Cheryl, we have a comment from Lori Hebert from the Gospel Fellowship Church, and she says, thank you so much for your session. It is so good to know that I'm not alone. Great. Thank you. You aren't alone. Um, there's probably going to be a few more comments that may come in, but uh, I just want to say a big thank you to you Cheryl as well as to Dale who we kind of see the shadow of his head off in your <laughs> off the <laughs> corner he's been helping you with uh, with doing your PowerPoint and stuff like that um, I'm wondering if Dale could uh, possibly say a prayer for us to close off your session and uh, we'll we'll actually leave it leave the chat open for a while and uh, give you the opportunity to answer any of those chats as they come in uh, if that's okay with you, Cheryl. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. 
Lord, thank you for the opportunity to talk about health, spiritual health, health, emotional health, mental health, physical health. Lord, they're all related. They're all important. They can't be neglected or isolated from each other. And thank you for Cheryl's journey and for what you've taught her, what you've taught us, and just for the the way you meet us in our point of need. Lord, I just want to pray for, for each one that's listening, for others that may see this later, Lord, that they would know that they are never alone because you are there and that you care and that you meet us where we are at if we are honest and open. And so, Lord, would you just give the strength and grace that each needs? And we just pray that you're for your blessing on, on us, whatever stage of the journey that we're at. And Lord, as we're walking that journey, that you, you will meet us as we, as we trust you to do that. Uh, bless each one that's been listening. And we just uh, ask for you to have your perfect will and, and timing and purpose in each one of us. And we commit ourselves to you in Jesus name. Amen. And thanks, Cheryl, for this this morning. Um, I just had a note here from Norman Duick from the Spanish Lookout Church. Uh, they had 11 people that were viewing your session from their church as well. Uh, so there's a number of people that are out there, and uh, this full session has been recorded. So for many of you, you will be able to see it again, or if you want to refer people to it, uh, we'll give you information yet as to how to how to how to how to view it as well. Um, so thank you very much. And we will end this at this point. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you.